Hello everyone, I'm Ash, here again to bother you with a good look at Netflix's latest original film release, Velvet Buzzsaw. Presumably you have watched it if you're here, and now like many, you're wondering what the hell you've just witnessed. From paint coming to life and possessing unpleasant gallery workers, to a giant metal sphere shredding a woman's arm off, to a homeless robot enacting revenge on an unimpressed critic. Some weird sh** goes down over almost two hours of runtime. But like any good piece of art, all of the strange strokes come together to make one larger picture, tying together the velvet buzzsaw by name with its bitingly ironic physical counterpart. Whether that picture is exactly clear by the end of the movie depends on how deep you want to dive, but before we can decode what happens in the final moments, however, we have got to start at the beginning and untangle the general premise of what has happened throughout the movie. So here we go, this is Velvet Buzzsaw Ending Explained. Intriguing in title as well as in its subject matter, Velvet Buzzsaw is the story of an art community plagued by a set of paintings with supernatural abilities, created by an unknown painter who quite literally rendered them through blood, sweat and tears. Jake Gyllenhaal plays Morph, an industry critic with a voice revered so highly that his reviews can make or break art sales, who ventures into a relationship with gallery assistant Josephina, the woman who discovers the art pieces and sets them up in her employer's gallery. Said owner, Radora Hayes, and competitive curator and private buyer Gretchen, as well as the rest of the world, are enamoured by the mysterious work, showcasing it in a successful exhibition and selling off pieces like hot potatoes as rich clients peruse the back catalogue. And it is here that the true meaning of the film begins to rear its ugly head. That money is the be-all and end-all of this world. The unknown artist, later discovered to be the mysterious Vettral Dees, wanted nothing to do with that lifestyle, having condemned his work to destruction upon his death and the meddling, greedy art world will pay for disrespecting its wishes. The essential heart of this film is a vengeful artist from beyond the grave taking out art curators like a slasher villain with the key modus operandi that money-orientated pretenders to the art world will be killed by his powerful works. Dee's backstory itself is shrouded in both mystery and violence, with the information that can be uncovered on him proving to be the stuff of horror films. Which is fortunate, since that's exactly where we're at, but anyway. Vettral Dees is revealed to have had a hell of a life, both suffering and causing his own tragedies along the way. In a debriefing with the private investigator, John Don Don learns that Dees was put into an orphanage when he was a child due to his father enacting cruelty beyond the bounds of humanity, with Dees and his dad being the only survivors of a suspicious house fire that killed his mother and sister. Once he turned 18, he was allowed to leave but suffered an intense breakdown, causing him to track down his father and murder him as an act of revenge for the abuse he suffered as a child. That wasn't before he tortured him, though, for days, finally burning him alive and spending 20 years locked away in a psychiatric hospital for the criminally insane. No normal hospital, this one rendered its patients as human guinea pigs, using them for medical experiments involving injections, shock therapy, and other unthinkable traumas. A court case managed to release those incarcerated there, at which point Dees left for LA, got a job at a veteran's home, and disappeared from public records, aside from one co-worker who knows his temper is murderous from a mysterious death linked to a man that treated Dees disrespectfully at the home. Living in his apartment block above Josephina, Dees poured his trauma into to his paintings, using his own tissues, aka blood, to form pieces that have a supernatural effect on the viewer and their subsequent interactions with other art pieces too. It is all pretty grim, to be honest. As for the body count then, the dead are usually discovered by poor receptionist Coco, long after they have been brutally murdered. We first see handyman Bryson sucked into a painting full of literal grease monkeys after he intends to seal some Vettral D's work for his own. And later, John Don Don is hanged in his own exhibition by a mysterious hand after intending to use a private report on D's life for his own gain or his opposition's loss. Gretchen is then offed after buying and selling Dees' work and using it as a leverage point in her career. Sucked inside the sphere and losing an arm in the process, her death is definitely the most interesting and serves as the most art of all when mistaken patrons at the gallery assume her body is actually part of the exhibition. Hmm. Morph and Josephina are consumed by artworks, and finally, Redora is sawn open by her own tattoo after ridding her house of every artwork she could find. 
Last minute laser tattoo removal is hard to source after all. It's these three final kills that prove to be the most poignant to the movie's themes. Dishing out just desserts to the key players that serve to make the most from Deez's unwanted legacy and acting as a nasty end to the murderous movie. Looking first at Josephina's death then, you can't say that Deez doesn't have a sense of humour. Damning her to be trapped inside a graffiti mural after shaming Damrish for leaving her impressive and wealthy gallery space so he can rejoin an unknown artist collective focusing on street work, it is a little ironic to see her shocked face forever imbued with the medium she deems beneath her. Importantly, her new lifetime as an art piece receives yet another layer when taken in the context of her previous quip, what is the point of art if no one sees it? Yes, she has been branded within a giant graffiti mural, but it's in the back alley of a car park in a neighborhood she'd never usually set foot in. No one of the art elite will ever see her in this painting, relegating her to a new life of obscurity as a footnote in a piece defined by the very work she hates. And even if they do, her superficiality means that she is just something to be looked at and her very humanity has been stripped from her, like turpentine to paint. Josefina has been punished for seeking fame and fortune from stealing a man's work out of his own home and usurping his last wishes in excellent form, becoming tricked into entering a supernatural gallery that then takes hold of her through creeping paint trails. The art world has consumed her with as little consideration as she consumed everything else around her. Her relationships, her job, and of course, Deez's work. As for Morph, his death is by the hands of the Hobo Man. Firstly, let us just note that he is named Morph, which is a great throwback to Art Attack, if anybody remembers. I hope that is the reference, because otherwise I don't know why he's called Morph. His death by the hands of the Hobo Man comes as a punishment for his never-ending criticism of art as a whole, living an elite lifestyle that looks down with a sneer and an adjustment of his designer glasses. Whilst Morph isn't necessarily likeable in the film, as no character is, he does try to write his actions. But Dee's neither forgets nor does he forgive. There is no going back once the wheels have been set in motion. He might have released a review citing the supernatural horrors of Vettral Dees and attempted to get rid of the work, but it was too little too late. Morph had already gotten too far down the rabbit hole by using Dees' status as a springboard to further his journalistic career whilst simultaneously damning artists to ruin with his reviews. Josefina's ex-boyfriend getting a purposefully bad write-up by request comes to mind, and his past crimes catch up with him quite literally. The Hobo Man doesn't lack courage when it is snapping Morph's neck, does it? Redora, owner of her very own gallery, Hayes, and the woman that stands to profit the most from Deez's work is the best save for last. Framed as a rebellious youth who played in punk band Velvet Buzzsaw back in the day, a name that is pretty familiar by now, her presence is the central driving force of the movie. After all, the tattoo on her back is the title of the film and the last puzzle piece in building a solid picture overall. Having broken into Josephina's apartment and strong-arming a deal to sell Deez's work, hiding half of it away to up its value, lying, conniving, and generally being the most profit-orientated she could possibly be in a world of money-hungry art grubbers, Redora was always going to get it literally in the neck by the end of the film, no matter how safe she thought she was by hiding all of her other luxury art pieces is away from Deez's supernatural reach. In an almost prophetic sequence, Redora and her cat line up as a representation of the very piece of Dee's work in her home, allowing the spirit to possess the tattoo and soar into her body as the film cuts out. Perhaps the best part of this is that Redora's old punk band is something that was done for the passion of the medium, a force that drove her to the art business for love rather than gain. Losing sight of that as a gallery owner condemned her to death by Deez, using the band that represented Redora's own artwork that was done without visibility in mind to remind her exactly why she deserves death in the first place. The placing of the tattoo is just the icing on the cake. She really did turn her back on Velvet Buzzsaw and everything it stood for, and now she's paying for it. Interestingly, whilst all of the art dealers succumb to a nasty fate, artists Peer and Damrish do not. Both are in awe of Deez's work, even mesmerized when they study it for too long. Its effect on them as obvious as it is on everyone else enamored with the art. The difference is that both Piers and Damrish look at Deez with reverence rather than dollar signs, and take that back into their own art by making things they want to make rather than what they think will sell. Damrish returns to his collective with roots in anonymous street art and graffiti work, and Pierce finishes the film drawing lines in the sand that the sea will wash away. Neither of them search out their fame and fortune, instead freed by Deez's spirit and undeserving of a malicious death. And we come to the actual end of the film with a street vendor selling on Deez's work, presumably salvaged from the car crash that took Bryson's life. Hanging it up on a fence and selling pictures for $5 a pop, whether the cycle continues on with the vendor at the heart of a new supernatural horror story is 
somewhat open to interpretation since he's making money off Dees' work, but the key difference is that it isn't greed that's ruling his sales. Instead of trying to build upon Deezer's legacy and manipulate it for profit, the street vendor doesn't know who he is, doesn't stick a ludicrous price tag on his paintings, and has no pretension or expectations about what he is doing. He simply found a box of art and is displaying it on the side of the road for people to enjoy and take home if they so desire, giving him a small amount of money to survive on in the process. And then we see a final shot of a painted sunset with two young children, symbolic of the end of Deezer's reign of terror and him with his sister in a happy alternate reality. Either that, or the orange glow is the pained figures basking in flames like the fire that killed his entire family, but the first option is a much nicer thought to end on. Overall then, Velvet Buzzsaw is an attack on the commercial nature of artwork, and those that prioritise their own gain rather than making and enjoying art for art's sake. And with a message that strong, it would be remiss not to look at Dan Gilroy's experiences with the film industry itself, as he's admitted some personal inspiration for Velvet Buzzsaw's strongly worded letter to the art community. Having penned a Tim Burton Superman Lives movie starring Nicolas Cage that was ready for filming, just Weeks before they were about to start, the project was cancelled. Gilroy was upset that a work he had poured his heart into was never going to be seen purely from studios worrying about their profit margins rather than the art. So instead, he channeled that negative energy into Velvet Buzzsaw instead. And there you have it. The film is a direct result of Nicolas Cage never getting the chance to go full Clark Kent on the big screen. The Vetral Deezer's name is an anagram for devil satire just turned out to be a lucky coincidence. but. An eerily appropriate one all the same. And that has been my take on Velvet Buzzsaw. But what did you think of the movie? Was it one long joke about D's nuts or was it much deeper than that? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section below. As usual, I've been Ash, this has been What Culture, and thank you for watching. Bye!